In 1894, Swami Sri Yukteswar, a great Hindu sage, described our solar system and the great cycle. We learn from Oriental astronomy that moons revolve around the planets, and planets turning on their axis revolve with their moons around the sun. The sun, with its planets and their moons, takes some star for its jewel and revolves around it in about 24,000 years of our Earth, a celestial phenomenon which causes the backward movement of the equinoctial points around the zodiac. The theory, the binary, is that our sun is rotating around another sun. And that, of course, the whole thing, the whole, the, the system, what you might say, is also rot rotating around what they call the grand central sun. Could it be that the ancient knowledge of this dual sun was lost during our descent into the dark ages of the Kali Yuga, just as we lost our knowledge of the heliocentric system? And as we now ascend toward the golden age once more, will science rediscover this binary companion? As we look deeper into the universe and expand our knowledge of its motion, we've come to realize that single suns are more the exception than the rule. Roughly half of the stars you find in the universe are alone and the other half uh, are in groups and often the groups consist of two and uh, if that is a group of two then we talk about uh, binary stars. But it can also be three, four, five, uh, there's no limit on that. Binary is that it seems to be the, the common observation in the cosmos now. Most of them are actually binary systems. With so many binaries in the heavens, why wouldn't our sun have a partner? Then again, if it did, wouldn't we be able to see it by now? With our high-tech observatories or the Hubble Space Telescope? While it might not be a visible companion, it doesn't mean one's not there. Some stars can't be seen at all, such as black holes or old neutron stars. And others, like brown dwarfs, are barely detectable. Also, the long orbit period of 24,000 years will make the connection of our Sun to a binary partner extremely difficult to detect. One sign we'd expect to see would be the changes in the Sun's rate of movement. In a binary system, orbital speed is not constant. And theorists say it would cause changes in the precession rate. As soon as two celestial bodies orbit each other, according to Kepler's laws, you have elliptical orbits. And if you have that, you have where when the bodies are closer to each other, they tend to be faster. And then as the other object moves further away, it gets slower and in again. If the current rate of speed were constant, a complete binary cycle would take almost 26,000 years. The scientists have confirmed that the rate of precession is increasing. In a binary system, this would mean the two stars are moving closer together, and the cycle would take much less than 26,000 years. Analysis of the data has shown that it is actually closer to a 24,000 year period. If we keep observing, if we make future measurements, that would indicate certainly that we are in a binary system. The cycle of a binary system might also be observed in the geological record. Mathematician Malutin Milankovic noticed the Earth has had global warming and cooling cycles that roughly correlate to the length of the great year. Just as the binary model answers questions of the past, it could also be applied to solve scientific questions of the present. For Hello everybody, hope everything's well. Now you heard in the first part of this video of them talking about binary star systems. In this article, it talks about how our sun is in a binary orbit with the Sirius system. It says here, this may be common knowledge by now, but it is essential to completely understand what is actually going on. There are many sources on the internet talking about this, so I'll keep it short. Our sun is in a binary orbit 
with the Sirius system and is the reason for the procession of the zodiac and not the sole uh, resolution of the Earth's poles. Now, this would mean that Sirius, that system, is projecting our reality. We know that Earth is the center of the universe. If it is in a binary orbit with the star Sirius, that would mean that Sirius is projecting this universe. Now, I want to read uh, something out of this book here, talking about the Duat. It says here, the Duat is one of the more complex and obscure concepts encountered in the Egyptian mythology. The name Duat comes to mind, a diverse set of enigmatic and sometimes contradictory images whose actual symbolism may not be entirely clear, even to modern-day Egyptologists. The Duat was the name of the mysterious Egyptian underworld. Okay, This is the underworld. All right, That's why you look up. We already talked about how this is hell, the, the covering. All right. Now it says a shadowy place of death and resurrection. Okay. On one hand, it was a place of light associated with the morning star, the dawn and the hours of the day. On the other hand, it was a place of darkness and ruled by the jackal, an animal that for both the Dogon and the Egyptians symbolized the concept of disorder. Now, that's just talking about what? Duality. Okay? That's why when it talks about it was associated with light at one point and then associated with um, darkness at another. That is talking about the dualistic world. That's the world we live in. The physical world. The world of disorder. Okay, now, um, in this uh, site, it states that the star system Sirius is moving closer, all right, and it will be reaching the closest distance in about 60,000 years, which it says here, all right, because they asked the question, when will Sirius will be closest to our solar system, all right, and here's the answer. It will reach the closest distance in 60,000 years, at which time it will be 7.8 light years distance and be at a magnitude of negative 1.64, only slightly brighter than its current magnitude. All right. Now, if you watched my previous videos, um, you would know. And this is why they have light pollution in their um, block in the skies, because Sirius is actually closer than you think. Remember, in, um, again, in my previous videos, we talked about the creation of the Neanderthal, which was about 52,000 years ago. Um, in the beginning of this video, remember, he talked about that procession of, of the binary orbit of the, of the, the star is actually a lot less than 26,000 years, so about 24, okay? When we did the math on that, on how long ago the Neanderthal was made until now, it was about 52,000 years. And again, if you go back to the first part of this video, he says it's a lot less it takes for, um, for those stars to get closer. Okay? So, and when he really, and, and this is cold, when they talk about the stars getting closer, they're talking about Sirius getting closer. So we're really only about a couple decades away. And this is and this is why they it would make sense why they're manipulating timelines as well. And like I said before, light pollution, um, blocking the skies with chemtrails, etc. Okay. Now I wanna read out this book about the nomo because they want to try and say that the dogon got their information from 
uh, this alien fish being the Nomo. When they descended with this knowledge from the Star Series. Okay? Uh, which the melanated man and woman come from, which we're talking about the absolute beyond eternity. Okay. Now here um, it states, and here's a picture of the normal, so you get an idea of what it's saying here. To quickly review the figure can be interpreted as depicting the following images: waves in the tail of the fish, which are defined as the underlying source of matter. Sorry, lost train, um, <laughs> the line there. Sorry about that. The point of perception of a wave that is the central egg in a ball, the dual figure of the pedestal on which the matter in its wave-like form is said to be raised after an essential act of perception. A squared hemisphere, the head of the fish, which we take to represent the concept of mass or substance, and four whiskers, which represent the four quantum forces, gravity, the electromagnetic force, the weak nuclear, uh, nuclear force, and the strong nuclear force. It would be fair to say that in Dogon cosmology, the fish defines the moment of perception of a wave, the same moment at which the future spiraling coral of matter is essentially rised up okay so when they try to say it was an alien fish no this represents the forces of our reality and this is how they depicted it all right now this next image is from the book uh, Serious Mystery by Robert K.G. Temple. And it says here, a family portrait, the first pictured uh, photograph ever taken in the 1970s 70s of Sirius B. Notice the six-pointed star, okay? Baphomet, all right? And this, now we will understand about how, why they have this six ether. All right. And the melanated man and woman uh, reside on the, the ninth ether. But we talk about this physical reality, talking about uh, these 66 different particles. Remember I talked about in my previous video if, um, before you make the transition. All right. And again, the Dogon knew about 200 and they know about 266 different particles okay which this also represents the star of Refan, all right which while well, now we know why they're doing these rituals because there's a there's a cosmic indifference bobby Hemmett talked about how we're having this um family feud all right now you're understanding how they're getting this particular information to how to keep people down on this this realm this is a picture from the u.s naval observatory so the naval u.s uh naval observatory scribes gets this information and then they distribute that amongst the naval bases this is how they're able to keep the these rituals up And how they keep in contact. All right. Now, here is a better, better photo of the star series. Now we know as we get, as it gets closer, the energy will rise, and we will return back to that realm. Um. Now, the temple of Set was created by a military officer, Michael Anquino. I probably butchered his name. He was a part of uh, the Church of Satan, which is just a front for Jewish mysticism. 
and he did a ritual to invoke Satan. Satan revealed himself to him as his true name, as Set. The phononic value for the word Set is the binding or the bending of mass. Okay? Now, I want to read this out of the first book I've shown, Secret Symbols of the Dogon, the Key to Advance Science in the Ancient Egyptian Hieroglyphs, which I, I've used this book in previous views as well. It says here that the eight master signs within the womb of all world signs drawing represent the eight Dogon ancestors who correlate to the eight Egyptian gods and goddesses. Each is the personification of a component stage in a larger scientific structure. Okay? So this is all just representations of scientific um, symbols. And their mythological attributes are careful descriptions of the corresponding stages of creation. Okay? So we now know that this is all just a process for one to become. All right? But it has now become a prison. All right? Uh, I want to play this clip by Danny Wilkins, who talks about how the, um, <clears throat> the Egyptian structures and how even in the Vatican is a symbolization of the body. Okay. Check it out. Hey, everybody. I wanted to make another video in addition to the one I made regarding those temples. As an addition, I wanted to show you what Ari Schwaller de Lubitsch uh, did with the Temple of Man. And this is the Temple of Luxor in Egypt that you see right here. And here is how he placed the human body on the temple. And as I said before, as you go to these different rooms, the hieroglyphs that he read, he determined that these rooms were actually uh, depicting in the hieroglyphs that certain part of the body that he's referring to. Now, in this next image here, you can see this is the cover of his book here, The Temple and Man. And I highly recommend that you go pick up a copy of the PDF or uh, buy it if you can. Uh, here's Solomon's Temple right here. From um, You can find these images right here on templesecrets.info. And then I have uh, this image down here. And this is also the same thing that uh, Ari Schwaller de Lubitsch did. He put this person on top of it right here, like this. So what I wanted to show you was I wanted to show you the uh, pa Vatican City, St. Peter's Square, one more time. Because of the area right here that uh, corresponds to uh, the stomach area. And what we actually see in St. Peter's Square and the roads and everything like that, I thought it would be beneficial for you to see the similarities that we have here. So I have these images up here. So here is the Temple of Man right here, Luxor. And here is the uh, St. Peter's Square that you see right here. Let's go ahead and zoom in just a little bit. Now I have this one slightly faded in, and I have this one all the way uh, faded in so that you can kind of see the transition. And what you'll notice is that square sits right on top of the area that's also widened right here. And then it narrows at the exact same point in place that it does here. And it ends in the head. Now you see how these dotted lines go down the legs right here? And right here is where the legs end. And I want you to take a look at the roadways. Let's just zoom into that real quick. 
If you notice these roadways that you see right here and what you see in this image here, where the buildings actually end is the level place. So what we've really got going on here is a lot of geometry that confirms itself. I'm not saying that Bernini actually meant to design it exactly after this temple, but it's very clear that he's designed it very similar because we have the area that's the largest and the areas in the stomach. And if you notice, this central area right here is right where the belly button would be on this person. So I thought this would be kind of interesting for you to see and see how it all plays in with each other. Uh, this is Vatican City, St. Peter's Square versus uh, the Temple of Luxor, which is also called the Temple of Man. And once again, you can see how the body divisions of this uh, where it comes out, the legs all the way down to the feet, level with the end of where the buildings are right here. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and post an, Im an image link to this so you can kind of analyze it yourself and take a look at it. And you guys take care. All right. See, so that is the reason why Brother Panic told you you are the Osiris, God of the underworld. Okay. Now, this book right here, Obelisk, Towers of Power, The Mysterious Purpose of Obelisk, by David Hatcher Chalras, he also mentions how the Omic heads represent or resemble um, that of the West African. Now, it says here, and they like to say aliens, okay, and we know that it's um, our ancient ancestors. Ancient obelisks were energy towers. David Chalris, popular author and star of the History Channel show Ancient Aliens, brings us a stunning tale of ar archaeological investigation on a megalith scale. Chalris looks into the uh, enigma of obelisks and their purpose. Egyptologists tell us that obelisks are granite towers that symbolize a ray of the sun, a megalith symbol of the sun god Ra later to be called a ton. Some obelisks weigh over 500 tons and are massive blocks of polished granite that would be extremely difficult to quarry and erect even with modern equipment. Now, you already saw, again, in my previous videos, how they're using anti-gravity, so that would have been easy to do. Um, why did ancient civilizations in Egypt, Ethiopia, and elsewhere undertake the massive enterprise it would have been to erect a single obelisk. Now, um, we know that there's obelisks all around worlds all around the world today, all right, transmitting energy. All right, here is an article by um, PBS talking about the world obelisks, all right, and it says here, for of the 21 obelisks, ancient obelisks still standing, Egypt itself can claim fewer than five. Rome boasts about 13, okay, which is on purpose. And why they have that there. All right. And why the Pope sees himself as a visitor of uh, Christ. All right. Which means he's just Christ. He's just uh, second in command to Christ, which we know Christ just means the anointed one, which I talked about in a previous video. Now, it says here, all snatched from the land of the pharaohs in Roman times, and the rest are separated from Istanbul to New York City. All right, and then you can click on here to see where they're at. I'll put this um, particular article uh, link in the description, of course. Okay. So they're still transmitting these energies with these obelisks to keep this uh, realm at a certain point. Now, these obelisks might be working in conjunction with the pyramids around the world. 
And for one who thinks that the pyramids are not active anymore, here's a picture of a makeshift pyramid made by Dr. D.J. Nelson and his wife uh, producing this energy using a Tesla coil. Okay? And as you can see, the spiral, because that's how energy travels. It's traveling upward. Okay? So this is what, when I saw this picture, this is what gave me the theory that I know these obelisks, these obelisks and these ancient structures around the world are still active, just being used for more nefarious purposes. That's why Bobby Hammett talks about um, destroying this realm. Clean slate, because that's what has to happen. Um, because that is the process of transformation. Okay. But thank you for listening, and peace and balance to the ancient ones.